Israel, Pablo, Justin. The penultimate hump day before the big dance. Today sort of feels like the last day of school before vacation. Also, another 60 burger in the NBA. Fernando Tatis speaks up about his offseason activities, and the NFL's game of quarterback musical chairs continues. Let's go around the horn, kiddos. Let's go. This is a graduate day of burger. Like a Are you seriously going to get rid of Baker? Reagan Mayfield after making a move into the stadium? Just started feeling like home. What a shame. Cleveland and quarterbacks just don't mix. After reports yesterday that the Browns met with Deshaun Watson, implying that they could trade Baker Mayfield away, the 2017 Heisman Trophy winner shared his feelings about the matter openly on social media. He says, I have no clue what happens next, which is the meaning behind the silence I have had during the duration of this process. I can only control what I can. I've given this franchise everything I have. Mayfield, the only Browns quarterback to ever beat the Steelers in the playoffs, has battled injuries in this past season, all on his rookie contract. Plus, using the notes apps means it's sincere. Tim, you've watched this young man play since <laughs> high school. Do you read this as a goodbye from Baker Reagan? Technically, I covered his first game in college as a walk-on freshman for Texas Tech against okay, SMU. Okay, good start. Very close to high school. About as close as you could possibly be. But I think we can all acknowledge <laughs> that Baker Reagan Mayfield is the great communicator among NFL quarterbacks. I mean, he's done all he can. He lives, as you said, in the stadium. What more do you want from the man for the four years he's given him? He played with a bad shoulder all last year. I think he honestly doesn't know if this is a goodbye letter. He thinks it probably is. Much like Jimmy Garoppolo kind of thought he was waving goodbye to the 49er fans earlier this winter, and now we may find out he, he could still be around. You never know in these situations. But if they're bringing in Deshaun Watson to talk to, then he knows the writing's on the wall and it won't be much longer. Is he? Yeah, look, Baker is a confident player. I mean, that's, part of that confidence is what helped him become that number one pick overall. He's, he's confident enough in himself to play through an injured shoulder throughout a season where he probably shouldn't have. And when you're the number one pick and come to Cleveland and could potentially be the answer, be the guy that ends that whole jersey situation, and you come out the gates looking really good, yeah, he probably thought he was that answer. He probably thought he was the guy for the, you know, for the rain, remainder of his career going to be a Cleveland Brown. And now when they're sort of courting Deshaun Watson, Watson, when they're looking for upgrades here and there and essentially telling them, I don't know if you're our answer for next year, but I know for certain we're not going to give you all that money you're looking for uh, after your deal is up following this year. So it looks like we're going to have to move on. Baker's going to be a guy that says, look, let me get out in front of it. Let me show my emotions. Let me be somebody who confidently says, hey, love you guys. Um, sorry this didn't work out, but we're, it seems like we're moving on. And that seems like where we are, because even if they don't land Deshaun Watson, it feels like the Cleveland Browns are saying, hey, he is not a 40 million plus dollar a year quarterback that you know, we want for our franchise. JT, is this a good look for the Browns letting go of the one guy that people actually kind of liked? Look, you alluded to it earlier, Clinton, though nothing should surprise me when it comes to the Cleveland Browns and quarterbacks. I would absolutely be shocked if Baker Reagan Mayfield is in their jersey next season. You know, look, of course, this is a breakup letter. You don't post something like this if you're not intending to break up. And I honestly think, as Izzy said, the Browns want to move forward. They don't want to run the risk of paying this guy thirty five million plus if he balls out this year. And I look, I know the Browns want Deshaun Watson, but Jameis Winston is still out there. Jimmy G is still out there. There's still quality guys out there. So for Baker, you're thinking about it like this. There's probably never a right time to say goodbye. But if you do, you want to get public sympathy, which is exactly what this letter is. So, yeah, we're likely looking at name number 33 on that jersey. And you know what jersey I'm talking about. Pablo, when's the last time you used the notes app, by the way? Yeah, man. Uh, the next time I do that, I will have officially left a job, I think, which is why this has all of the vibes that we're seeing and feeling. And look, Baker Mayfield is the confident commercial superstar, right, that we have seen on TV. And so the question for me was, OK, why did he go this way? Why did he go for, as Justin put it, the sympathy as opposed to the I don't know, uh, resentment, right? Like there's a world in which Baker Mayfield may truly feel like, what are you doing? Like, I'm still me. I'm your guy. Why are you doing this? I would have expected maybe some version of, I don't know, Odell Beckham Sr. cutting up that video, right? We could have gotten some version of that. But instead what we got, because I think the negotiation is going this direction, what we got in the absence of leverage was a cry for us to feel bad for him. And it's a brilliant move from that perspective, right? Because when you don't have leverage, you go for sympathy. And when you are the guy who is the number one overall pick, a Heisman Trophy winner, a Heisman finalist beyond that, 
you want to be the David as opposed to the Goliath, right? I am now an underdog, is what Baker Mayfield is saying, because none of you guys respect me anymore. And that little attempt at switching the narrative is pretty smart in my book. Izzy, Izzy, do you think the Browns are better off, by the way? Look, I do believe it's one of the it's the most difficult uh, position to, to judge, and it's really hard to say because you know he had the, the type of rookie year that he had. However, when you talk about the interceptions since what 2018, the most in the league, when you talk about not being able to get along or have a relationship, a good on-field relationship with Odell Beckham, you have enough red flags to say, okay, I should not be paying this guy with the top tier of quarterbacks. In the Tim, league. last word. You know, I, I just think he's a very difficult quarterback to evaluate. The last time he was fully healthy, they won a playoff game with a run-first offense. And, you know, maybe not great receivers, but is he the reason they weren't great receivers? We don't really know. Just don't understand how you get rid of a guy who's got that much energy. Clinton, because as much as I'm impressed by what Kyrie did here, dropping 60 on the Magic, and what he did last week, by the way, dropping 50 on the Hornets, when they play the actual good teams, they're going to need a guy who can play defense like Ben Simmons. But I want to just, I don't know, raise a glass to Kyrie Irving for all of the controversy, rightful controversy that has followed him, right? The whole vaccine saga. For all of that, when people call him the most skilled player in NBA history, I just want to translate what that really means. It means he's the prettiest player to watch drop 60. It's the idea of the aesthetics of Kyrie Irving. It's that Steph Curry thing of like, wow, I think I could be him because my build is like, I'm also kind of a small yeah. guy, right? And people see that with Kyrie, except he also has the handles and he also has all of the English that he puts on the ball to finish at the rim in ways that are even more death-defying than what Steph Curry has been doing. So do they need Ben Simmons? Yes. Are the Sixers right to, by the way, tank to avoid the Nets for that reason? Also, Yes. But this is about all right, enough with the Sixers. That's all we already hear from this guy. Tim, have you ever rooted for the opposing team when you were at a home game? Uh, have I done that? I'm sure I have, uh, but I can't really verify exactly how that happened. And it wasn't as a member of the uh, unbiased media, trust me. Let me just say this, though, about Ben Simmons. Do they need, they'd like to have him. I can't say they need him. They just had 53 from Durant and then 60, 60 from Irving. They need different laws in the city of New York. That would help. Beyond that, they need to avoid being, here's what they need to avoid, being the seven seed where they're stuck playing home games to try to get in without Kyrie Irving and maybe get eliminated before they even get to make a run. Otherwise, being a low seed, they'll always play game sevens on the road. Kyrie will always be available for those no matter how things play out in New York. And I think they're in pretty good shape. Izzy, how do you think this shakes out for the Nets? Yeah, my favorite quote uh, on Kyrie Irving was from Kevin Durant after he dropped 50 on the Hornets. was basically pointing out that he's 5'10 or 5'11. And it just kind of makes you, wow, he's doing all this around all these folks. But I think with Ben Simmons in particular, yes, he needs them. I mean, not unless they're playing the, you know, the Hornets, Knicks, and Magic. He doesn't, they don't need them. But they need them in the playoffs. And frankly, they need them, I would assume, for that five position, the center position, sort of to unlock the possibilities there. Because, look, Andre Drummond's going to be attacked by the good teams. Nick Claxton has some limitations. And some of these better teams, they're going to go with a smaller type of guy in the center. You can get away with Ben Simmons. Simmons there. You put that together, that could be that uh, combination that you need. JT, what's going on with Brooklyn? Clinton, I'm going to agree with our boy David Dennis. <laughs> Kyrie doesn't have to work until next Wednesday. Let him go for 70. He scored on all nine defenders last night. 17 <laughs> of his 20 shots were contested. You know, uh, I know a lot of people are going to look at Orlando and be like, oh, it's the Magic. They've had the best defense in the league since the All-Star break. If they keep that game within 20, Kyrie might go for 75 or 80. And look, that's the thing. The Nets, as Tim alluded to, they're always going to have road court advantage because they're never going to advance that high up the standings. I trust, Kevin, I trust Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. They can win you four games anywhere from here or anywhere in the Milky Way. That's just how good they are. So they're not the question. The question, Dios mio, is Ben Simmons. There's 14 games left in the season. So we're looking at the possibility of, you know, a postseason debut or we don't know. We don't know how tricky these back injuries are if he plays this season at all. So, yes, Brooklyn could use him back. They want him back, but they know the main thing is to have Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. That's the main concern. Pablo. But listen, th speaking of the shot that actually matters here, right? If the standings play out as such, the Nets get the Raptors in the play in round. You can't play in Canada either. Incidentally, right? Because of their vaccine laws. And after that, you're a home team if you win. So this is a giant problem. And yes, for those reasons, you need Ben Simmons and a legislative bit of help there. <sighs> Izzy, do you think we're going to see him in the regular season at all? 
I don't think so, because part of the problem is you're going to have to see him in the regular season because you don't want to throw him in against, let's say, Philadelphia or Miami and just see how that works. You're going to have to get a taste because there's no easy first round matchup for the Nets. All right. There's your horn. Izzy's up. I like you guys' blazers today. You know what else I like? JT, repping for those of us who don't wear suits to work. See you on the other <laughs> side. <laughs> Buy or sell time. Just when we got all excited about baseball, we learned that Fernando Tatis Jr., arguably the most exciting player in the game, would be out for months with a wrist fracture. Yesterday, Tatis told reporters, quote, it could have been anything, and by anything, maybe he means that motorcycle accident back in December. Tim, should the Padres fans be satisfied with this explanation? Oh, I think they can be okay with the explanation, but they got to hate the fact that this happened and they hate the fact they're the first victims of this lockout. If he did hurt it back in December, he could have called the doctors. He could have gone and had the surgery in the middle of December. He could be getting ready to play right now. There was no communication between management and players allowed. This is what happened. Is he? Yeah, but even then, he said it, it wrist only felt jammed. It wasn't until he started prepping for the season about a month ago that he went and got it checked out and re recognized that it was something worse. And so, yeah, at, even in that scenario, it could have saved them about a month. And so, in a win-now Padres team, it's really tough when your best player is out for maybe the first half of the season. JT, how much did the pod suffer from this? This is a major loss for, for everybody. If he's out until after the All-Star break, then the Padres season is basically over. For Tatis, I get he's only 23, but that's another season of his prime gone. As Tim alluded, as Tim alluded to, for Major League Baseball, this is a lockout knockout. This is one of the, the biggest faces of the game, and he's gone for the foreseeable future. No one wins here. No one. Lockout knockout. I like that. Pablo, you got any rhymes for me? I mean, look, there was a line that Fernando Tatis Jr. gave when he was asked about, you know, the motorcycle incident in question. He said, which one? Which is worrisome, right? Like, okay, wait, there's a sort of history here of him and motorcycles, and he's pledged to not ride motorcycles anymore, which is nice. But the reason you sign a guy to a 14-year, 340-something million dollar contract, Lynn, is because you're trying to win now. Not in year 14, right now. And this is why, if you're a Padres fan, you are absolutely terrified by all of this happening. Absolutely. Awful situation for one of the best players in the game. Moving on. Dayton, stand up. The first four games got underway last night, and former basketball powerhouse Indiana, they beat out Wyoming behind Trace Jackson Davis' 29 points. Rutgers and Notre Dame play tonight, and since the tournament expanded to 68 back in 2011, a playing team has won the next game in every single year but one. Also, by the by, Texas Southern won its third ever play-in game at number 16. Can we just let them in to the tournament next time? Come on. <laughs> Justin, do you think a first four team could pull off an upset again this year? Yep, I'm going with Rutgers. Uh, they have six quad one wins, four of which came after February or later. They're 15 and one when they hold opponents to uh, 65 points or fewer, and they're fueled by underclassmen, most notably Ron Harper Jr. I could easily see them making a Sweet 16. Izzy, who you got? I've got Indiana. Not only do they have some sort of travel issues last night leaving Dayton, and that always sort of uh, spears people to some sort of underdog story, but Jackson Davis against St. Mary's might end up being the best player on the floor. They're only three-and-a-half-point underdogs in this one. I'll take Indiana. It's the home of the Flyers. You can't have plane problems there. Tim, what you got? I struggle with the idea <laughs> of Rutgers doing something like that, given that they did the impossible already. They lost to four Big Ten teams that didn't make the tournament. That's hard to do when nine teams True. were allowed in. I think Indiana has a sliver of a chance, but I don't think it's a great chance. And last but certainly not least, Senor Torre, the floor is yours. Glenn, I don't think it's a first four teams year to make a big upset. I do, though, think that because this is the most chaotic we've ever seen the NCAA tournament ever, ever, a 16th seed will upset a one seed once again. And I think it's going to be Norfolk again. State upsetting Baylor. Baylor is vulnerable in ways you guys don't appreciate. 198th in defensive rebounding percentage. They turn the ball over a ton, 18% of the time. This is a team that has weaknesses. And Norfolk State, out of the MEAC, man, those Spartans, watch out. Again, that is a word that makes... Absolutely no sense in that context. <laughs> Moving right along. We all know Buzz Williams is an intense guy. And last night, after his Texas A&M Aggies beat Alcorn State in the first round of the NIT, the head coach had a lot to say about the fact that his team got snubbed from the big dance. 
He talked for nearly eight whole minutes straight, chalk talking his team's resume and calling into question the integrity of the selection committee. Quote, sad is the wrong word because it doesn't completely express the totality of our emotions. Izzy, do you understand where Buzz is coming from in totality? I mean, sure. Like, I understand it. But that's the type of complaints you lead to, like, the Dick Vitals and the Jay Billises of the world. In large part because when you're whining and being this much of a crybaby just to get in as yep. possibly a 12 seed, like, if I'm thinking about going to Texas A&M, that's not what I want to hear. I want to win championships, not just get into the day. And so it kind of feels like a little late and a little Tim Kalshaw. You know, I do think the Aggies should have got in, first of all. But I left during the intermission last night with Buzz, and I didn't go back <laughs> for the rest. This is a team that lost eight straight games this season. That's a good point. Anytime you have an eight-game losing streak, maybe you shouldn't be too certain of anything. JT. This was like an eight-minute we-need-to-talk text to the NCAA. <laughs> but, of course, I understand, man. They were 24-12. and 12. They lost in the SEC final and beat Auburn and Arkansas along the way. Their resume was much better than Notre Dame up and down. And I'm tired of this Notre Dame bias. Uh, Notre Dame bias all across sports. Pablo. Look, as somebody who just got muted for making a very bold pick, as someone who once got minus 300 in the year that a 16 seed actually did beat a one seed, but I didn't pick that team, I empathize with Buzz Williams. That's an injustice. I'm currently suffering one at the hands of Clinton Yates. I don't understand why my pick didn't get more respect. I'll be honest with you. I had eight minutes on that, too, if you need it. Maybe nine, maybe ten. Not about you. We got a tiebreaker situation here. We'll do a quick guessing game. Who did I pick to win in our bracket challenge? Wasn't me. Oh man, Duke. Tim? Arizona. You get the point, Tim. You were closer because I picked Gonzaga. No! Tinsley, <laughs> Kalashaw. Let me get you guys back here. Geographically closer? That's the difference? That's the difference. So <laughs> yes. Big Cowboys fan. The other one hangs out with the Cowboys he used to know at the park. Let's do this. NFL free agency news of the day. Chandler Jones to the Raiders. That pairs him with Max Crosby as they chase down the likes of, I don't know, Patrick Mahomes, Russell Wilson, and Justin Herbert. Yikes. Tim, what does this do for the Raiders? It means a lot of primetime games for the AFC West, the division to watch in 2022. Look, Derek Carr might not be quite at the level of those other quarterbacks, although he was very good last year. But how do you, how do you combat that? You put a defensive end on each end who commands a double team. That's what the Raiders have that nobody else has. Absolutely. If you're playing in that division, you better be able to get after the quarterback. And I know we love all the quarterbacks in, those, in that division, but watching those pass rushers in that division is going to be just as exciting. There will be no East Coast bias when it comes to the AFC West next year. They're going to be the division to watch in football. A lot of AFC West means a lot of autumn wind. We like that. We're going to split the point. Next one, hockey time. Alex Ovechkin, the greatest Washington capital of all time, passed Yaramir Yager on the NHL's career goals list, a Wikipedia page he is rising up through at an amazing pace considering he's 36 years old. Justin, of course, you know I come to you. Of everyone on this panel today for hockey of first, do you think that Ovi can catch the great one? I happen to think he's the greatest Washington team sports player of all time and definitely, obviously, the greatest capital of all time. I do think he will catch Gretzky. But my favorite part about all this, Yamir Yager telling Ovechkin, hey, look over your shoulder. I'm still playing hockey. Congratulations for passing me, but I might come back and pass you. Tim? I think 894 is going to be a hard number to get to. He may get close. The mere fact he's going to get within 100 is a testament to, to Ovechkin maybe being the greatest scorer of all time. To do it in this era where it's defense first and goalies look like they weigh 300 pounds compared to when Gretzky played, Edmonton routinely scored over 400 goals a year. Completely different game. Incredible what Ovechkin's doing. Tim, history lesson. Justin, haters lesson. Last one. Let's figure this out. More teams, more overtime proposals, still no wedding. The Colts and the Eagles want both teams to have a chance with the ball, and the Titans think that if you get the ball and score a touchdown and a two-point conversion, the game should be over. Tim, what say you about all these ideas for free football? You know, I know a lot of people get upset when somebody doesn't get the ball in overtime, but they don't really have a proposal that – you know, tells us how is the game going to end. So if both teams score a touchdown, now we're just going to keep going. If the first team kicks a field goal uh, the, on the third possession, does that end the game, or do they get a chance to tie that? 
I don't like any of these proposals. If you're me, playing in overtime, you've already failed. You didn't win the game. Let me talk to the NFL anyways. on this. Let me look directly into the camera to the NFL. I'm going to quote a guy you're in partnership with. Jay-Z once said, cry me a river, build a bridge, and get over it. I hate all these rules. Keep the rules the same. All these suggestions suck. Like, you can't tweak something that's already been tweaked. He's making a good point. And JT, you quote Jay-Z, you're winning in my book. Take the win, buddy. I know everybody's excited about uh, March Madness. It's a great time of the year. I want to bring up a player who, one of the great college players of the last 20 years, at least Michael Beasley. He was a recent guest on the Pivot podcast with Ryan Clark, Fred Taylor, and uh, Channing Crowder. Uh, this is a guy whose reputation has preceded himself and kind of taken on a life of his own. I implore everyone to watch this. This is an emotional, honest, and very transparent interview. And Michael Beasley, like you've never seen him before, please take time to watch that. Thank you for that, JT. That's going to do it, folks. Thanks for coming around. We are on a 119 and a half an hour break. We'll see you Monday. Go watch some games. <laughs> Way off.